Hey, what's up, guys? I'm pretty excited for this week's episode. I think it's a killer episode. I just want to do a few announcements first. I want to thank our promotional partner at Let's Design Daily on Instagram. They curate amazing design work from designers across the world. So check them out if you haven't already. They support us, so go support them. I also want to ask, hey, if you aren't following on Spotify, subscribe on YouTube, or giving us five stars on Apple Podcasts, go do that. It really helps the podcast out. And then we're still running the 2019 Minor Details Podcast Survey, which is a great way for you guys to give us feedback on the podcast. And also, you'll be entered to win one of our bottle openers. So check that out. The link's at minordetailspodcast.com. Also, I think this episode is going to spur a lot of good conversation over on the Discord. So I want to hear your comments. I want to hear your thoughts. Go check it out if you haven't already. It's like a giant chat room. A bunch of awesome designers in there. You can find the link on our website again. And then heads up, I think there might be one or two expletives in this episode. But other than that, let's get started. Minor Details. I'm Nick. I'm James. And I'm Dan. And we are super excited to have Dan Grossman on the pod today. Thank you. And Dan, if you guys aren't familiar, is the Associate Design Director of Smart Design currently and has a, uh, a good range of experiences under his belt. Has worked at Husqvarna, Lifetime Brands, Martha Stewart, Prime Studio, has done a lot of consulting, uh, also worked at Bark, and we're super excited to have you here. Awesome. Good to be here. Thanks for having me. Yeah, of course. And for whatever reason, you have hired both of us. This is true. (laughs) You're my first. Yeah, you hired me when I first got to New York. Yeah, I think because of you, because James, because you connected me. I was was like, this kid is desperate. (laughs) (laughs) I was like, I have really bad work to give to somebody. (laughs) Will you please take this this young and in shelter? I mean, yeah, it was just like you know, clean the shelves, organize the samples, just really you know, I not had, great. I, get, I had to get coffee for you. It was yeah, it's not good, but yeah, no, it's uh, it's funny. I we all we have worked together, which is nice. Yeah, yeah, we have collaborated on different projects, so that's cool. But I I think this is our chance to really understand who Dan Grossman is because Oof. I don't think we've really asked the the historical questions to right. understand who Dan Grossman is. How much time do we have? <laughs> is there enough? Seventeen seventy six. The Declaration of Independence. Um, <clears throat> yeah. But yeah, we we, we kind of like to ask our guests, you know, how they got into design. What kind of design did you do as a kid? Did you even know about design? And kind of how your career progressed from there. So I don't know. How was your childhood in terms of design? <laughs> In terms of design, I'm just gonna cut right, just cut right to it. Okay, yeah. Well, uh, no, um, <clears throat> yeah, no. I, I, uh, I was definitely lucky growing up because design was a big part of. Actually, I was surrounded by a lot of it as a child. Um, I come from a family of my mother was an interior architect. Mm. Um, I think the three I look at it like the three ins- the three inspirations uh, that kind of led me to where I am today is my mother was interior architect, my father worked in business, and my uncle, who was a Wall Street guy, was an engineer by trade mm. originally by training. So I kind of had like this uh, surrounding of that influence from in different ways and. Um, A different aunt and uncle were also architects here in New York, and they had a practice, and they actually did the um, the children's portion of the Bronx Zoo. Hmm. So um, that's cool. Yeah, so I I like to say I grew up in an Eames chair because um, (laughs) there was this I I, there was an Eames chair in my home, and as a kid I was obsessed with it. Yeah, and I have it now in my house. You were born with a bent plywood spoon. Wait, wait, which one was it? Which Eames chair? Uh, The Eames lounge. Okay. Yeah, no, it's Ooh. like it's an original from the 70s. It's in the rosewood, which they no longer make anymore. So the leather is beautiful. The wood, it's like it has like the luster. Mm. And it's like, like a real, designer's dream object. It, it was, you know, it's it's funny. Like when I was a little kid, I remember this fight very clearly when my sister and I, such a terrible fight to have as a child. You're like, <laughs> well, when, when mom and dad die, what do you get? Oh. <laughs> and, and, <laughs> and my sister... We were a big music family, and she's like, well, I get the Beatles albums. Oh. And I'm like, well, I get the Eames chair. Oh. 
and my oh, parents yeah. are like, ooh, <laughs> good grab, <laughs> good call. <laughs> so did you grow up in New York? Yeah, so New I York was, City. Yeah, uh, born in the city. Upper West Side, in oh, wow. Riverside. Okay, it's funny. I actually re-registered at NYU for they have a new medical app, and when I when I re-registered on the app or registered on the app, they uh, they pulled up my original birth location. They're like, "Are you still at 89 Riverside?" And I'm like, "No." That's crazy. They like my phone number and everything. I was like, "Good yeah. records." Yeah. Um, so yeah, I lived in the city, and then uh, till I forgot what grade, like eight or nine or so, and then moved to Westchester, just north of the city. Um, but I've lived in New York my whole life, pretty much, except for going to school and, at SCAD. But uh, yeah, so I grew up in New York. Was very fortunate to have a creative family. Spent a lot of time at the museums, like very much that type of life. Um, which was great, a lot of influence and in just creative arts and whatnot. Um, and then I was very much a, kind of a cliche of I was like an angry high school kid, didn't know what I wanted to do. I was I was terrible. I was not good. And I had an art teacher yeah. who saw the potential in me. And she pulled me aside one day and she's like, I'm starting a graphic design class oh. in high school. So at that point, I had like played around with like Illustrator and Photoshop at like my uncle's on his computer. He had like an Apple II, right? Like I remember like those printers that were like zzz, with like the rip off, tear off sides. <laughs> yeah. So you'd like just like mess around on like you know Photoshop version one on things like that or whatever. Um, but wait, it printed out actual images? No, or? no. Do you remember? <laughs> you probably don't remember this, but there was these printers that had these like tear off perforated oh, I remember. sides. I, I remember those things. Yeah, yeah. So that's what I was referencing because okay. I like it's okay. kind of like stuck in my head. That's like it was one to one. Right, right. But uh, anyway, um, yeah, there was a graph design class and it was the first time that someone showed me that I could do something creative in a professional way even though yeah. i was around it i never yeah. like put two and two together like why why did she why do you think she pinpointed you for that like was it anything that you were doing were you bringing in that work it's from a, it's a great question miss rosen um if you're listening <laughs> <laughs> um, please write into the podcast <laughs> please let me know I, i'm sure she probably met my mom at like parent teacher oh, conference yeah, night yeah, it was yeah, just yeah. like you know you know <laughs> It's like, why doesn't he know this? And it's yeah. like, because he's a jerk. <laughs> I mean, yeah. I mean, I was just wondering if, like, in your derelict activities, if it was like designing like posters for like people's no. bands or, or like you know flyers, show flyers. You, you know, I was very. I worked a lot as a kid. I was very much like I always had to be kept busy, and um, I was taught very early on if you want things, you have to earn them, which right. is good. Um, so I, I had when you turn fourteen in New York, you can get a job. That's state law. And mm. when I turned 14, I ran to get one. And the first job I had was a bicycle mechanic. Oh, that's cool. So that's I was fun. building bikes, and wow. which was really fun. I was like building and repairing bikes. And then they noticed that I had this problem where I wouldn't shut up. <laughs> As the listeners will soon learn over the, the course of this next hour. <laughs> um, and they were like, you should really work on the sales floor. You need to, like, you need to go. Like, go out there. Yeah. And um, I would then went from, like, to ma like building bikes to selling bikes. And which is funny because I think about, like, now, like, the, the duality of that role and what I do now is probably very similar. But um, I worked at a, as a bike mechanic. I worked at an RC shop. Um, I've never what owned. What is RC shop? I've never owned a remote control toy. Oh, you mean, like, radi Radio Shack kind of thing? Like a Radio but it was, like, it was a hobby store, okay. and it was just RC. Okay. And I would, again, build and, like, help design these, like, cars, sweet. planes, helicopters, and I would just, like, work yeah. on these. I never owned one, but I was just, like, I was, like, I just, like, doing it. I just, like, thought it was, like, really, really cool to, like, build them and to, like, customize them and things like that. That's, like, so, a dream high school job. I had to just mow grass. I'm, yeah. Actually, you know what? <laughs> I had a, so I did a lot of jobs. Uh, then the next job was even better. Do you remember slot cars? Yeah, yeah. So like you you pull the trigger and the car goes around the the track. Right. Right. Yeah, yeah. 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 So there was a slot car place by my where I grew up in Westchester, and um, there I got to work there. And again, like I mean, it's not as cool as RC, which is like you know infinite possibilities. Yeah. If you're on a track and you just literally pull a trigger, and do these things, but. You got there was a lot of birthday parties there, so uh, free cake and ice cream. <laughs> yeah, so, so that's that, the perk. I so guess. that was the good job. 
Um, anyway, I, I like to think that like you never actually went to school. You just like worked your way up through these shops to be the VP of design at Smart. There's there's like literally no record of me at SCAD. I just I've just been working. Yeah, this is amazing. Snuck yeah, in. right after slots, slots, slots. Actually, the slot shop. Actually, I didn't walk for graduation, so that is actually true. Oh, but yeah. you graduated. I did graduate, okay. but yeah, I think no, I graduated. But yeah. uh, we'll get to that. Um, but yeah, how did you get into, I guess you were kind of into this building things, yeah. um, in high school, you did a little graphic design. How does that transition into college? Did you even know what industrial, like, where was that point? We love that point. Of right. Like, when did you find out about industrial design? I, I, and that's a funny thing. It's like, I didn't know, right. like it wasn't something that was talked about. And, um, you know, I started, it, it just really was visiting schools and looking at catalogs and things like that. And I started in graphic design. And as soon as I found that, I would go home at night. I like, you know, I found like some illegal version of like Illustrator 7. Right. And would just spend up all night just like designing stuff, just like at a two, uh, 2D, you know, whatever. And then I started looking at schools and then I found like 3D animation. And I'm mm. like, cool, I love that. I can do that. I want to do 3D art. I was, but I was never a gamer. Like right. I like I said, I worked in an RC store and I didn't even have a car. I was just like, <laughs> <laughs> I was like wasn't interested, and um, I uh, started looking around at different schools. And then all of a sudden, I think I was probably talking to somebody, and they're like, "Have you heard of industrial design?" And obviously no. And I just visited the department, and I, I don't even remember which school it was, but I just fell in love. I was yeah. like, "Yep, that's it." Yeah. It was just like so obvious. Yeah, yeah. It was just like so stupid obvious. I'm like, yes, this is what I'm going to do. Yeah, it's so funny. I don't think anybody ever walks into like account an accounting class and looks around and goes, "Yes." Yeah. Because like, I think there is something <laughs> there, so there maybe <laughs> maybe I don't want to discount it, but I think there's something so visceral about walking into an industrial design studio. It's like it's either going to grab your attention or it's not right like it's gonna be like this big moment of realization because you can see like the physical product of like the product of all these kids like right. experimenting and but you model know making you know what's funny about that though it's true you go into the studio and you see all these things and you see the gallery and you see like this the workshop I don't think as a student, as a young person going to visit college we ever look at the students because mm. if we did we probably wouldn't have <laughs> Like, they had, just there's like, some sort of back room that they <laughs> right. to. just like you know just no one slept and yeah. it's like foam in their hair like <laughs> no one walks in and goes I want to be that person right. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. but uh, they do it on like off hours but, right so right. Yeah, so you know I was I found this graphic design program I was immediately hooked into design I found the the discipline I wanted to do and I started applying but that was my senior year now and what I did was I was really I like I said I wasn't I was kind of a bad kid so I cut a deal with my school my high school where I was like I'm just gonna do art yeah. my last year of high school the whole th the whole year the whole year no Wait, there's you, no way how do you cut a there's deal there's no way <laughs> Is because they were just like get out <laughs> They're like, you have got to go. <laughs> so I, like, I took like a math and science and that was it. Like almost yeah. like zero. And right. then they just let me work on, work in the art studio, the full, like wow. I took every That's art elective. Crazy. So when I went to college, by the time, so I visited schools, I fell in love with SCAD. I was from New York and um, my, my, I had alum, my mother and aunt went to Pratt, but I was like, mm. I knew I was going to end up back here. So I wanted to see something different. And right. it was actually my art teacher who told me about SCAD. Because uh, at that point, no one had heard about it. This is, you know, um, early 2000s. Right. And, uh, yeah, it just didn't wasn't the school, that, the notoriety it has today. And um, I ended up uh, going down there. But when I did, I went with a really robust portfolio. So I had, like, 2D. I had photography. I had all these things that I had done. So because of that, SCAD's a quarter system, as you know. Right. And by my second quarter, I was allowed to, I got exempt from foundation year and oh. I got right, I joined the ID department my second quarter at SCAD. Wow. So you kind of skipped a little, some of the classes. I knew what I wanted. Like I found it. I fell in love with it. I, I feel was like, all about it. was this as a result of all the, the salesman skills you had gotten at the bike shop? Did yeah. you just talk people into <laughs> yeah, like. I think so. <laughs> Are you you're one of the designers that just talk people into things? Is that is that yeah, the story? I'm a schmoozer. Um, you know, it's it's a it's a curse and a blessing. Yeah. Um, I I mean I when I met you I was like this is like 
And you told me that you had lived in New York. I feel like I've met I've met other kids that have grown up in New York, and I feel like the gift of gab is just you gotta you have to have you have it. to have it. Yeah, is New York just like the talking city? If you gotta get stuff done, you gotta well, I mean, talk your I way into like it. I feel like New York has probably changed. Do you think since um, since when you were growing up? You know, uh, yes. Well, yes, New York has changed. Well, yeah, every, as I mean, a I city, guess everything changes all the time, but. But, like, people-wise, demographic, when you're a kid, you have no idea. Right. You know? And, I mean, like, I'm, I was born in the 80s, and, like, New York was a very different city. And yeah. I had, I was completely blind right. to, like, what was happening and, like, you know, with homelessness and poverty and graffiti and crime. And, like, yeah. you know, by the 90s when I'm a little kid, at that point, again, I'm living on the Upper West Side. Things are fine. Right. Um, and so it, it's definitely changed. Uh, the people have definitely changed, I'm sure. But... I've changed with it. So mm-hmm. it's all, it all feels very normal to me. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so um, went to SCAD, did the thing, uh, loved it, did ID. I was fully hooked into it, just got completely immersed in the discipline and the department and became very involved. Um, really, really loved it. And then um, I got my first internship. So I guess we'll move into professional. Yeah. It is surprising yeah. to me that like none of your, like, Neither your mom or your relatives would have known about industrial design. I'm kind of mad about it, honestly. Yeah. You know what's really funny? Um, uh, I mean, I'm sure maybe, maybe they told me about it. I was just like, I'm really not. Uh, You're like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I got to like, get down to the up. bike shop. I yeah. got to move. I got to move. <laughs> Don't tell me what to do. I'm, I'm punk rock. <laughs> You're like, you know, I was like stupid. Right. Yeah. Um, uh, actually, our first VP of design that I ever worked for was Adam Krent. Yeah. And he was a family friend of my aunt and uncle. Ah, and they never connected me to him. That's weird. They're like, oh, yeah, we know that guy. I'm like, really? Because I asked you if you knew anyone. <laughs> After I graduated, I was like, any connections? They're like, yeah. no one comes no to one, mind. No one. <laughs> you were too busy moving product down in the yeah, bike shop. Exactly. Were- well, you know, so that place is called, that was called Danny's Cycles. Yeah. And now when I was there, it was the original one in whatever it was in, in Yonkers. And they now it's a it chain. Dan? Did they change it to Dan? No, but you? that was always, oh my God. Gross. I was nuts. a teenager. And like, you know when like there's like a bad joke that everyone tells? Yeah. yeah. I'm like a teenager and I'm selling someone a bike and they're like, Danny's, Dan, do you own the store? <laughs> and you're like, oh. you're like yep. And, <laughs> you're, yes. That's me. Yeah. I'm, I'm a whiz. <laughs> I'm a business whiz. You know. Yeah. You were the Wendy of Wendy's. Right. I was Doogie Hauser of the bike shop. <laughs> yeah. Um, but okay. So school. Before we get into internships, yeah, yeah, yeah. were there were there any sort of like profound points in school? Any like hard earned lessons? Mm. Like yes. Wh- you know what was the education at SCAD? Because I'm sure there are people who are at SCAD now who are right. listening to our podcast. Like. What was SCAD like back then? Because it was, was it a pretty young college at that point? They did, did they have, were you in Gulfstream? The Gulfstream uh, building? So the building that they're in now, or I think they're still in, right? Gulfstream yes. didn't ex- didn't exist back then. Okay. We were at this building, FOM, which is right. still there maybe now, but it was in a really bad part of town. And mm-hmm. you had to walk from the the dorms to it yeah. through a really, really bad neighborhood. And it was this tiny little building. And... Um, it just was really new and very fresh and it mm. felt very like uh skunk works almost like, excuse me. And it was just like, uh, just kind of like this really fun environment to be in really right. like messy. Right. Um, so I kind of fell in love with that. Um, and, uh, you know, hard learned lessons, man, so many. So, well, first SCAD, every school's different and some schools are known for different things. And I don't, you know, I'm, it's funny cause I'm now trying to talk to SCAD about getting more back involved and hopefully I'll, I'm going to start going back down there this year, next year, I guess. But um, uh, at the time, it was right around the time. This is, I, you know, not to date myself, but I was uh, 2002 when I was a freshman. Mm-hmm. And it was just around the time that, like, interaction design and UX and UI is really starting to take off. Smartphones don't exist, right? You know, we all working off these, like, big, slow workstations. And, right. and we, we just have, like, a 3D printer. So there was a professor at the time who brought UI and UX to SCAD through the interaction design minor, mm. which was a subset of ID. And it became very clear. There was like immediately when this guy started, his name is John Colco. He uh, actually went off to open up a school in Austin, Texas mm. called uh, Austin Center for Design, which mm. is a one-year grad program. It's really cool. And I encourage everyone to check it out. It's a, kind of like a social impact um, uh, master's program um, through the lens of interaction design. And 
um, whatever, yada, yada. But um, he started this minor there and there was like immediately this like split, this fracture mm. of like the kids that like to draw and the kids that like to get dirty and the kids that like to read and mm. the kids that were like really smart and really like more like strategic. And like immediately it was like, I want to design shoes where it's like, I want to design systems. Yeah. Right. You know? Yeah. So I, but you, you're on the dirty side. Yeah. Well, I, well, you know what? I did both. You straddled. I, well, yeah, I, I did straddle. <laughs> um, yes. Uh, no, you know what it was? I, I actually, I, some, a lot of us, you could do both cause there's a minor, mm-hmm. but I've, I've always been a little bit of both. Okay. And although I lean towards traditional ID and that's why I stuck with it. Um, I love, I learned so much from interaction and it's funny because I felt like I wasn't being challenged enough mentally. Mm. I felt like I was being child pushed creatively and I was like, you know, getting better at drawing and model making and learning about form and art history and all these great things that art school offers. But like, I, I wasn't like working my brain enough and I didn't really, I, I told you I did only art in high school. Yeah. So I was like, <laughs> well, at least what I paid attention to. So I was like ready to learn. I was like, right. um, um, so I started, I got into interaction design. I took the minor and it was really, really pivotal for me because it taught me research and strategy and just process in a way that the ID department wasn't focusing on, Mm -hmm. at least for me when I was there. Um, So uh, that was a huge lesson, I think, very quickly, is that I started to see, you know, when you first, I feel like as a student, you get into industrial design, it's super literal. We make things. Right, yes. Because you're taught to, like, make a cup. Yeah. (laughs) Make a lamp, you know? And then you start to see those layers, and that's actually like the spider web of like right. the different things you can do with it. And that was probably the most pivotal thing for me where I could mm. see like, I was like, wow, there's so much that my professor doesn't know. There's so much that I can learn outside of here. There's so many things I can do with this. Mm. And that just kind of opened up like the hunger to learn, and to, which is I probably still have today. Um, so that was interesting. Um, other life, tough life lessons. Um, well, ones I want to tell and ones <laughs> I don't want to tell. <laughs> well, I mean, maybe you said you had an internship during school as well, right? Yeah. So, I mean, it's a good life lesson. So, I, yes, yeah, so I was uh, about my junior year. I was, you know, at the time, and I hope they do a lot better with it now, the internships weren't a big focus. I don't okay. know if it was for you. Uh, when you were there, but um, they just didn't really like talk about it that much because there was only, frankly, there really weren't that many options. So at the time, there was three that you could get, and there it was were, oh, wait, they had like offered at the school they had internships. So there was recruiters that came. Oh, I see. Okay, and there's okay. only three companies, at least in the ID department at the mm-hmm. time, that did it, and they're all in power tools, or that's they're all in like mostly power tools. Right. Mm-hmm. Yep. So it was Husqvarna where I worked, Ryobi TTI. Uh, which is like rigid and Ryobi power tools yeah. and then Electrolux, which is white goods. So like um, dishwashers, right. fridges, things like that. Yeah. And those three internships were spread out in Georgia, North Carolina, South Carolina, that whole area. All three of those companies have since relocated to Charlotte. Um, but at the time I, so junior year, I'm living in Savannah. I moved to Augusta, Georgia, uh, which was an experience. Um, <clears throat> Cause the only thing in Augusta, Georgia is the master's tournament and that happens once a year. <laughs> Um, so is this deep Georgia? Is I mean it's not I mean, it's not like it's a city. Okay, yeah. but it's James Brown is from there. Okay, so that's cool. There's a statue of him that's like oddly misproportioned. Yeah. in downtown. But I mean, did you feel <clears throat> good about it? Did you know that you would? Um, <laughs> nice, <laughs> nice. <laughs> is that a he lyric? doesn't get it. Yeah, that was. But a, anyway, that was a subtle deal. I hope someone out there gets it. I don't. Uh, yeah, <clears throat> milk squirting out of their nose. <laughs> it's, uh, James James Brown. Everybody, just listen to him. Um, so you know what it was, it was, I was, I, you know, I was learning, I was doing all these things. I was hungry, but I felt like there was a ceiling I was hitting as a student and I wanted to get out really quickly and and start learning more. And this internship came through and I applied and I was really fortunate to get it. It was super exciting. And I moved to Augusta, Georgia, which was only a few hours outside the city. Um, and the rent was actually so cheap that I actually kept my apartment in Savannah and come back on the weekends, which is awesome. Uh, so I was like, I'm like, you know, 19 and like technically rich. <laughs> like I have two apartments. It is, it is interesting when you first get that paid internship or like paid design job. It it's like a, a moment of joy. Oh my god! Because it's you've been working so hard. You've been designing at school. You aren't getting paid anything. You're right. paying someone to teach you, and then finally someone's right. paying you to design. It's like. 
holy grail. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think at the moment that you start getting paid, you start to realize that like when your parents refuse to buy you certain toys, it was out of principle and not because of price necessarily. <laughs> <Right>. Sure. <laughs> but uh, but anyway. So so yeah, I moved there and um, it was such an amazing. I mean, the best decision I ever made because it. I mean, it was real. You right. weren't, and it, it, we were treated as designers. It was yeah. like, great, welcome to the team, get to work. Right. And it was like, heads down, the first two weeks I was there, it was heads down, 40 hours a week, sketch. Yeah. Just draw. Like, here's what we're working on, figure it out, go. And that's when I started to, because, you know, we had 2D, and, like, you had, like, design ID sketching class and things like that, but you're not really working at it the same way where you're layering and you're using tracing paper and you're using like different levels of just like techniques and all of a sudden you're surrounded by these really really talented people um so you're just kind of like absorbing it super yeah. fast and yeah. um unbelievable experience uh so Husqvarna was a Swedish company um there's they are a Swedish company uh but at the time they also owned the license for Craftsman for Weed Eater Poland Pro so I was working on leaf blowers chainsaws uh, also, like they had, this was one of my first experiences at a factory, which was really cool. They had a, so the, the office was in Orange, I'm sorry, the office was in uh, Augusta. The factory was in Orangeburg, South Carolina, which is like middle of nowhere. Okay. The engineers are in Texarkana. So you have like this weird, like, like mix of these three cities that are all fighting for the same product to get done. And I remember like one day my job was to go to the factory, drive to the factory, sit in front of a pressing machine to watch these chassis on a riding lawnmower get pressed. That's so cool. And literally just watch them all day. And they said, figure out how to reduce cost on this one item. There's too much metal being used. Figure out how to reduce costs. They, that's a lot of responsibility for an intern. Yeah. yeah, I mean, and that's the thing. It was like you were treated like it was like welcome to the team. You got you're here to help, and so you had to take pictures and do all these things. And I came back and came up with sketches and like cut this corner, do these things. Right. And you know, I mean, it's cool. That's, I mean, yeah. that's some deep industrial design right there. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and it's just you know, it's funny because you're like, it sounds to. To anyone listening to this podcast, like, that's cool. <laughs> to anyone who doesn't do industrial design, like, that sounds horrible. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, it was so great. <laughs> yeah. Like, yeah, but it was. It was cool. It was real. And and then we got to do, like, and then that's, like, the first time we actually do, like, real user testing mm. where they're, like, you're designing a chainsaw. Here's a chainsaw. Go cut something down right. and come back that's, and tell us how it was. I mean, that's some good user testing. That's here. great. To, to use a chainsaw? like I mean, we're like, this is great. So it was just an amazing experience. And um, it was funny because uh, that, so that internship, it happened every, so it was uh, SCAD, Auburn, and Virginia Tech. And those are the three schools that were uh, uh, scouted for these internships. And basically, you had at least two to three people at each each one. And that year, this is now like 2004, 2005, um, we were at, I was at the IDSA conference in Atlanta, and all the interns, we all knew this program, so we all had friends. So I had a friend at at Ryobi, and I had a friend at Electrolux, and they had friends at my place, and so on. So we all coordinated and met up at this IDSA conference, and we're all still, most of us are all still really good friends to this day. Hmm. So James Krause, who's now head of design at... uh, Quip. Uh, Quip, he that's where I met him. His wife, oh, who's no way. yep, his wife, who he she was at. So James was at Ryobi. His wife now uh, they were dating at the time. They uh, she was at Electrolux. <laughs> She's now a, 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 a high up creative at RGA. Mm. And I have a friend. This it's like a really small network. Yeah, uh, yeah, Danny yeah. Lentz at uh, started Aquapaw. Oh yeah, yeah. Uh, Virginia Tech grad. Yep. Yeah, he was there. So we all met up. So you never know. Yeah, keep, you know, you know, they say don't burn bridges and keep friends. This ID is a small freaking industry. It is, and stay in touch because, because yeah. again, it's been a long time. But anyway, so I did that and it was great. Um, came back to SCAD, uh, so that was why I never walked because I took all this time off. Right, <clears throat> and SCAD's a trimester program. So you can go to school during the summer as right. well. Mm-hmm. So I just kind of started going to school year round at that point, doing different programs and doing different, you know, those competitions and whatnot. I kind of got involved in that. And um, yeah, uh, graduated. And uh, as soon as that happened, moved back to New York, uh, moved to. Br- Did you have a job in New York lined up or you just graduated with the expectation that you were just going to be in New York? Um, I actually wanted to move to Austin. Uh it was like Austin was just happening. Okay. Um, everyone's like, 
whispering, Austin. I'm like, I'm not moving. To fr- I mean, at this point, I lived in Georgia, so I'm like, I guess I'll move. I'll live anywhere. Yeah. And then uh, just for family reasons, I had to move back. And um, my cousin called me up, and he's like, hey, I heard you're coming back to New York. Um, there's this cool neighborhood that used to be really dangerous. It's called Williamsburg. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no one would ever live there before, but now we all live there. Yeah. <laughs> you got to come. Yeah. <laughs> and we got this like sick loft on Morgan Stop before Roberta's was out there. Yeah. For like 700 each. It's oh like crazy God. huge loft. Man. And, yeah, <laughs> and just like, I was like, lived it up. Yeah. So yeah, I didn't have a job lined up. Um, I came back and uh, got really lucky with another internship. Um, where where was that? So I made some connections uh, through SCAD, and some, I think that's what it was, and got connected to a firm called Nice Ltd, which is uh, still around today. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <clears throat> yeah. Let me get some water. What kind of? Um, so ni- Nice Nice Ltd is a studio or a firm that does what kind of products? Or Nice is a firm that's uh, they're based in New York. Um, but I think they have locations across the world now, Singapore, maybe Japan, and as well as they had one in Paris for a little while. But um, Nice is uh, packaging focused, beauty, fragrance, mm. um, consumer, CPG type stuff. Yeah. And the reason I took it was because I was very much like, again, I, I'm, I, I like to see myself as like a forever student. Right. And when I went to Husqvarna, I won, I learned to sketch, I learned CAD, I learned like, I learned it all. I learned like power tools and right. like real like nitty gritty industrial design. Yeah. But like it's so driven by function. Like it's about this is a tool and it has to do right. something. And that is such on this side of the spectrum. The complete opposite side is beauty. And it's how do you make something which is precious, which is small, which is right. perfect. Yeah. And we would be working with Valentino and Hugo Boss and just like these like couture brands that I know clearly nothing about <laughs> i mean you know 22 year old me is not couture i mean you refuse to let us put any makeup on you because you were gonna handle it i'm a natural we, I'm a, james and i both put on makeup every episode yeah that's no. why our faces glow the so viewers much. can tell <laughs> um but yeah no that's really i've always found the beauty industry really interesting because it's it is so much more i mean i guess power tools can be very much about feeling because I feel yeah. like it, like a lot of those beauty brands get much more at emotional, like or maybe just a certain type of emotion that that like I don't know power tools don't I mean, necessarily. The, the beauty stuff is very much aesthetic driven, like it's very brand and aesthetic 100%. driven. Yeah, as compared to tools, which does have have like that functional aspect that you do have to include. So right. I don't know. That, that's that is a good like contrast to. Husqvarna. Because I feel like when you Complete design, opposite. if you're yeah. designing like a casing for some sort of beauty thing, it's not necessarily so functionally driven. Right. Like with with power tools, oh, you don't want to be true. wasting any sort of space or anything. I mean, they're already these sort of like big bulky tools. 100%. And you want to be optimizing it. Whereas like beauty is like express this however you need to express this well like i remember working on this leaf blower at husqvarna and we were fighting with these engineers about the casing of the fan and they wanted because of the airflow they had to have a certain amount of holds like you know it's a total calculation of the actual airflow that goes in and comes out and all these things and they literally want to put holes that are big enough for me as an adult to put my finger through which means a child can put their whole hand in there yeah and you're like (laughs) And you're like, you're out of your mind. You're like, we're not doing that. And they're like, well, that's what it requires. You know, and that's yeah. like, those are the problems. Those, that's, right. like, that's like the friction. Wait, so what happened? <clears throat> I mean, design probably. Millions of people <laughs> died. If you saw Dateline. <laughs> <laughs> no. are, they, are the kids running around with their hands? Exactly. There's a whole generation of children. It's my fault. Um, no, I mean, I mean, it's a balance. It's, it's, a, it's a dance. Design is a dance, right? right? And um, you kind of like have to work with the factory. You have to dance with the engineers. Right. You have to do this whole thing, and that's really what that was. Yeah. Um, beauty is totally different, and at least so when you, when people hear packaging, there's primary packaging and there's secondary, right? And right. for an industrial designer, secondary is not so exciting because it's like the box that that thing comes in. Right. But primary is a lot of times we think about like the bottle you get at the store or like the beauty, right? Right. Or like a, a fragrance. Um, 
And designing a perfume bottle is like the craziest challenge because the brief, like think about a design brief you get today. And it's like, if it's tech or if it's a, if it's a piece of furniture, there's like these like rules and requirements and it has to like function or look or feel a certain way. Right. A beauty project's like, we have a new scent. It's called happy. Go. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and you're like, cool. Yeah. <laughs> okay. This, this thing needs to. Uh, physically embody the the emotion of happy. Yeah, like that is a crazy problem. Right. Um. It's funny. I don't know if you saw uh, this article Philippe Stark just wrote recently. Yeah. We saw that about like yeah. the future. There'll be no designers. Right. But he talks about his favorite thing in there that he just recently designed, and it's his new line of fragrance. Yeah. Right? <laughs> which is an awesome design. Um. It's like these connected yeah, bottles, yeah. and everyone should check it out. I mean, <clears throat> it's like, like super ambitious and really really interesting. Yeah. For for I can remember, it's. They're they're more rectilinear glass fragrance bottles, and then inside it yep. has a very, you know, uh, like come on, That's organic cool. kind of shape that, and and there's several fragrances, so the organic shape kind of a, connects all together like a puzzle to to form this like design. It's really interesting. What, what's what's cool about this? I think, at least. I mean, this is a controversial. We're gonna get a lot of people are gonna hate it. I don't know. I'm sorry. I mean, but I'm not a Stark fan, but yeah. what I like about it is that it makes me want to buy all of them. Yeah. It's and a... scent is a really personal thing. Mm. Like everyone feels like, you know, what everyone likes and what I, everyone feels differently about right. smell. Mm -hmm. And something like this is actually the first time I've seen somewhere I'm like, oh my, like, I need to buy the whole set. You know, where it's like these are really expensive, precious items. Right, because right. you have to have the whole set to complete the look. To complete the thing. So I'm confused. Is like all of the scent is actually around this this thing on the inside? Yeah. Okay. I believe so. I mean, I don't yeah. know. I don't I wear mean, that would make sense. I don't because there's don't wear no perfume, connection. <laughs> there's no connection between <laughs> the nozzle and and the shape that's within. I do but think, I think that's the, crazy. the perfume trend is on a decline, actually. Like, I don't think millennials are buying as much fragrance as past generations i don't know but yeah, it's because we all stink but you know what it, the, look it's 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 a fascinating problem to solve and right. that's for me was like a really great challenge yeah. and it was like totally different and i was working in a different industry and it just it taught me form yeah. yeah and like i thought i knew form before but i really understood form there or at least tried to understand it there yeah and it was also the first time that i really learned what a thumbnail sketch was mm. so you've always heard that term right thumbnail yeah. sketch yeah yeah I worked for a creative director, this guy Ian Carnduff. He's still out there. He's still in charge of, he's still ahead of there of the design department. And he would do a sketch the size of his thumb. Oh, literally a thumb. Literally a thumbnail. Nail. And it was right. We'd be like frustrated on a form and we couldn't get it right. And he'd be like, ah, no, guys, it's this. <laughs> Just the tiniest sketch. Oh, and, wow. And you're, and, but it's like, it's, you know, it's a, it's a thing. It's a bottle. So you, right. you, you get it. And you're yeah. like, oh, my God, that's so good. Yeah. And that'd be so... It's like one thing when, like, you know, the boss comes and makes it better. Or, but yeah. When all it takes is this much, I was like, damn you. A little square inch of like, that's paper. Yeah. Or was it just like a Rorschach test? It was like Probably. so small that you guys were all like... That's the thing. Like, right. you had to saw the genius in it. You're like, totally. your subconscious saw through yeah. and could solve the problem that's hilarious um so i did that yeah uh, so that, that was an internship though that was an internship and then you got a full-time position i yes. at some point yes at some point i decided <laughs> i have to actually make money yeah yeah no you know what uh the internship was actually pretty lucrative i just it wasn't for me at yeah. the end of the day right. like it was a really great experience and i learned a lot and it was awesome to do it but um uh it wasn't my category it wasn't for me i wasn't passionate about it and i think design is so much about passion that if you don't immediately connect with it it's it's tough to to sink your teeth fully into it right so i did it for a while and um it was great and then i went off and did a couple other things and then um uh ended up at uh, lifetime brands um actually before that i actually got that was my first step into nonprofit. um so um, we're really gonna have a tangent yeah now. let's yeah. do it um now i'm thinking about it uh i was looking for a job i couldn't find a job and I got connected to Pratt. And Pratt had this thing called the Design Incubator, which was right. really, really cool. Yeah. This is like before startups, before Kickstarter, anything like that. And the head of the ID department there started this thing called the Pratt Design Incubator and was for students to launch their own things and to collaborate cross-functionally with other universities. And I had this background in interaction design 
And because of that, I understood a lot about design research and things like that. So I was actually brought into this project where they were designing um, low-cost uh, blood testing devices for rural clinics in Rwanda. Whoa. And I'm like, this is the dream project. Yeah. I'm going to save the world. Right, I'm going right. to do these things. And like, I was very much that kid graduating college being like, I am here to do great things. Yeah. And I'm going to use design and I have a superpower. Right. And I'm going to save the day. And this was very much that. And I actually had a, I got a chance to work on this device and this whole initiative. And that was an amazing experience and a really hard experience Yeah. because before that I had worked for a brand. I worked for a company. I worked for, you know, I was a student. I was a worked for a company. Then I worked at a consultancy yeah. working for brands. Yeah. And now I worked for a non, now it's like this nonprofit third party organization. It was a partnership between MIT, Columbia and Pratt all working oh on this God. thing. And I immediately, it was about, it was like all of my dreams were just like immediately shattered when you start to see what goes behind, you know, the bureaucracy, right. universities, tech, all these things, these things clashing. Yeah. Cause you're like, we're here to help people. Right. And right. yeah, we, we want to help people. Right. But we got to raise money. We got to, right. got to get a grant. You got to, you do, you do have to pay for these things at some point. You like got, someone has to manufacture. Right. right. So the did this ever see the light of day? No, it got a lot of press. Um, yeah. at the time it was called lab on a chip. You could check it out okay. probably. Um, I, I was like I said I was I, I was just a part of the project. Um, and this was during the internship. I mean, no, this is was, like on its own. So I, this is I kind of like on a told tangent. This is kind of like an unpaid. Is this this is unpaid. Pay? This is unpaid. unpaid. That's kind of I mean that's basically the premise. So lab on a chip is something that's been it's a it's a principle that has existed and that has never. I mean maybe it works. I have no idea. Like I'm sure it's out there. But the idea is that other devices use it. It's just basically this idea that you can run a series of tests on a single th a chip. Right. So other uh, medical devices so use this. So is this like the original Theranos? Sure. Yeah. Let's go with that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Probably. Yeah. I mean, again, I, I I was just like a consultant on this project. Right. Right. Um. So I did that. I mean, and that's cool. I did that, and actually, and then I worked for Lifetime Brands. I mean, I can keep going with the nonprofit thing, but, um. So. Lifetime Brands was your first. Lifetime was my Re first real, real full time real first yeah. time job. This, yeah. this is the this keep is the me moment. on track. Yeah, yeah, keep me on track. This is the moment where you get a full time job. Yeah. So yes, so I was at Lifetime, and so Lifetime Brands is a company for all those who don't know. James has talked about it probably in the past. Um, it's one of the largest kitchen tool, uh, kitchen gadget cutlery maker in the world. Probably the largest now. They own brands like they own licenses. Excuse me. Like KitchenAid at the time, they owned KitchenAid and Cuisinart, which was really funny because they were competitive brands. So when Cuisinart would show up, we'd hide all the KitchenAid, and <laughs> KitchenAid would show up, we'd hide all the Cuisinart. That's interesting. <laughs> which was crazy. Um, but it was a, it was the best first job. I really do encourage people to apply to that company because it's one of the best first jobs you can have because it's such a huge company. They make so much stuff that you're going to work on things that are going to get they're going to get made. Right. right. It is like a true path to market production design job. You are designing something, you're in charge of it. They give you something to design, they said, oh, this is what you're designing. I'm in charge of it. I send the the drawings to the factory, I get the sample back, I comment on the sample, right. I send it back, I get the second sample back. Yeah. I do the final like the whole process. Yeah, you're you're holding you're holding your ideas hand all the way through. It's awesome. Yeah, yeah. And like mm -hmm. my first thing was a cutting board. And like in hindsight, you're like, is that exciting? I'm like this rectangle of wood. But it was so exciting. Yeah. Because you saw it, it was like my baby. Yeah, you know? for sure. Yeah. For sure. And then you do more complicated things and, and it just, you know, it goes up and down from there. But it was a great first experience. Um, really learned a lot. And you you were how long did you you work there? I was there for about three and a half years. Okay. Um, just working on a bunch of different things. Uh, but the other nonprofit thing I do I feel like I do have to bring this up. Is um, so I was I was still I still my you know hadn't been totally diminished yet my hopes and dreams to save people. Um, I was at uh, so this is before Open IDEO and before um, IDEO.org and if everyone doesn't know about that you should check it out because IDEO is really they have split as an organization into different factions and they have a whole wing of their company which purely focuses on these nonprofit initiatives right they partner with like gates foundation and other large organizations like nonprofits. it's awesome but um i was at the so at icff the international contemporary furniture fair every year at the javits 
um, I was there and Metropolis Magazine had this lecture series and they may still do it. And it was like in the corner. And I had to go because Yves Bahar was there to oh, talk yeah. about the one laptop for child. Yeah. It had just launched and we were all freaking out over it. <laughs> We're like, this is amazing. He has, a, you know, again, I don't even know if we have smartphones at the. I think maybe we have smartphones at this point, but like, it's like really, yeah. really exciting. Right. Yeah, this is the this is the project where he designed the. It, it's it's very playful looking laptop, but well, actually, didn't we learn during Joey Zeldin's Continuum. podcast that Continuum started it and and Yves Bahar that's or the, Fuse Project yeah. like cut cost and yeah, that's, and took yeah. the project Fuse away. Project stole the project yeah. away yep. from Continuum. Continuum did all the original uh, groundwork on it, and Fuse Project finished it, which is an interesting interesting story. So, you, so you went to see so Yves I went, Bahar. I went to see him because, again, like even he, back he's then, he's a big draw. He, right? was, he was a big guy. He's famous. And then. he gives this great talk, and it's awesome, and whatever. But then this girl gets on there. This young girl was like my age. She gets up and talks, and basically says, "Design is bullshit." And you're like, <laughs> oh, "What?" <laughs> we're like, "But we're at a design conference. Like, you can't say that." And. It was this young uh, young woman named uh, Emily Pilton, and she actually wrote something on Core 77. She posted this. She read this article called it was like the Designer's Anti Manifesto. Ooh, interesting. And it was this, it was like we're going way back. And she wrote this article basically saying like, I went to design school. I did everything right. I hate my job, mm-hmm. and I have this job. I think she was working for, as like a fixture designer, doing like store retail or something like that. And she was just miserable. And she got into design for the same reason a lot of us did was to save the world and to like do all you know what we thought we could save the world and so right. all this all this stuff and um, and she kind of like gives this really really amazing compelling converse like talk about just the frustrations of design and all these things and she's like I'm starting an organization and it's grassroots and it's on the ground and I want to do it all over the world and I want designers to come help me do really cool projects out in the field. It's like, we're going to figure it out together. Yeah. And at the end of this, at the end of this whole like little mini conference, there's like 10 people lined up to go talk to Yves Bahar. And there's like a hundred people lined up to talk to Emily. And I was one of them. And I was like, I'm talking to her. And yeah. it just like blew me away. And I got, I spoke to her, we hit it off and she started something called project H design. Uh, so Project H Design was a nonprofit uh, design organization. Uh, it had off. It had uh, we had locations in New York, L- London, L.A., uh, San Francisco, uh, South Africa. Um, the project you're pulling up right now, the Hippo Roller, that was a project that she actually helped partner on. Um, so she didn't do the we didn't do the original design on that. They helped do the redesign on mm. it. Um, but it was basically like a grassroots nonprofit design organization. So this Hippo Roller, you, so. You, you guys worked on the graph. You said graphic design. Like? No, no. So I didn't work on this project, but um, this was basically this is like the types of projects that they were championing, championing. Right. Yeah. And which, were, which, and maybe if you aren't familiar, if you're just listening, this is the project where I guess it's it's based in third world countries where they have to walk to get water from the well. Right. And instead of carrying the water, they designed these big barrels that you can actually just roll on the ground. Roll molded. Yep. Ro- yeah, roto molded barrels. Exactly, and, and here's you just pull along. And here's the thing. Um, so this is this is like I talk about. I I, I want to talk about this stuff because I know there's a lot of students out there listening. Right. Yeah. And that have a lot of. And look, you know, you, you need a dream, and you have to you have right. to push, and you have to fight to bring great design to people who need it, and to help solve real problems. This is such a phenomenal example of a, a real solution to a super real problem. People having to carry extremely heavy jugs of water, you know, vessels of water for miles and crazy weather conditions. It's nuts. This simple idea of being able to push, push a barrel of water is amazing. Here's the thing. Why has no one seen this? Because that is a really expensive thing to do. Even though rotomolding molding is not the most expensive way to manufacture something, this is a part of the world. These are parts of the world that don't have money. They don't have access right. to these great to, to factories to ship these large vessels of empty, you know, plastic across the world is really expensive mm-hmm. to pay for these things, just to store them, to sell it. It's, it is a logistical nightmare. Yeah. Right. And a pro- so this project actually started with a wheel and a rope. 
So the original, ver- the, the very first version of it was literally like a donut. It was like a, it was almost looked like a, a tire. Okay. And it had a rope, and that was it. Huh. Yeah. But it was like not enough water, so they right. like grew it into this thing. And it's right. stuff like this, which was why we got involved. Yeah. Because we're like, how can we help? How can we make this better? It's, it's. I feel like it's almost more of a design problem to figure out the logistics of the solution than the actual solution, right? It's like. Yeah, huge. We, we, we come up with we came up with these good barrels that you can push around and you can pull with these these handles and people get water really quick. But now, the real design is like, how do you fund this project? How do you ship all these products to the third world countries? How do you, yeah, how do you give these to like? You can come up with solutions all day long. It's how right. do you execute. It's all about the execution. And this is where I think I first started learning about like the business of design. Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. Where when you start to actually, and look, in, again, this is years ago, and the world's very different now, and you can, you know, you know, go on Alibaba and order, you know, design your own thing and send right. it. Like, it's so different. It's yeah. awesome. Yeah. But um, the project that I got involved with, we were actually working with another organization called Architecture for Humanity, which unfortunately is another organization that's gone defunct. Mm. But Architecture for Humanity was this incredible a uh, group of people I originally I think based in New York and they were literally building homes for people around the world yeah but again just eventually just went went bankrupt frankly is, is this from that so no so what you're pulling up right there is actually so I did a project for her called Learning Landscape this is still Project Age this is still Project Age mm-hmm. the Learning Landscape was a project I did and what we did was we worked for oh, yeah. we worked with a, an AIDS orphan school in Uganda in partnership with Architecture for Humanity so they were building the school in this very rural part of the country and while talking to the schoolmasters, they were saying what else can we do to help and they're like well we struggle to teach kids math mm. which is like this amazing like light bulb moment you're like because this is the world you know we're all the same right doesn't matter where you are math is a hard subject yeah so how can we come up with a solution to teach kids math in a more interesting way so excuse me when i met uh emily um that was what she asked me she's like i have this project i don't have the bandwidth for it are you interested and i'm like heck yeah i'm interested i'm gonna do this so um what originally was supposed to be like a math game turned into this scalable system so we created this grid so basically what it is it's an outdoor physical playground right and we wanted to give people something that was impactful i don't want to go because you know it's this idea of like the the savior of complex we go to these parts of the world that didn't ask for our help and we're like right. we're here to help yeah, or we're here yeah, to yeah. save you yeah, and yeah. we give them things that they don't necessarily need so we're like, what is something that we could give them that actually they'd find beneficial and useful and isn't just solving one problem, but could be solving a series of problems. So the more we kind of took the step, took a step back from the problem and started kind of exploring it, because we had this really great team of people working together um, uh, uh, who uh, kind of like built this whole thing. Um, we came up with this concept called learning landscape. And the idea was that by using reclaimed tires, you dig them halfway into the ground and you create a grid based on the size of your class. And then what the tires become are physical flashcards. So by using chalk, you can write on them. Mm. So one side can be the solution to a math equation. And you'd say, uh, okay, you have two teams. And you say, okay, five times five. And the winner, the, the, the student has to run to 25. Right. And the first kid to sit wins. And the first team to sit wins the game. Things like that. Or you can have flashcards where one side's English, the next side's Spanish. And so um, because they're tires, you can turn them into, you can tie ropes around them. You can roll balls through them. Or you can turn it into an outdoor classroom. So we then design these benches, which would snap and modularly fit over it. And th- this, this, all this design work that you're doing for Project H was just on the side. Like this was just. F- I had to ask, volunteer for fun. Yeah, I had to ask my boss at Lifetime Brands. Shout out to Bill Lazaroff for letting me do this. Okay. I took a month off of work. Oh whoa. Okay. Yeah, I saved up money, and we before Kickstarter, we. Um, raised money on this like third there was like some third party bank right on the online that basically had like i was like telling people to vote for my project and you know this is now like 2008 and people are like what are you talking about that's not how the world works like you don't just like vote for things to get money <laughs> <laughs> and i'm like no i swear it's real please send me to africa and yeah. um and we won and we ended up our project our bid won and i got to go they paid to send me there and i saved up enough money to pay my rent while i was gone wow. and i took a, a month off of work and moved to uganda to do this project 
That's a lot of fun. That's awesome. So really cool experience. Amazing thing. Uh, the thing you had pulled up before just to, to close the loop on that. Uh, so Project H, it's a business. To go back to the whole thing. Their design is a business. Right. And at the end of the day, Emily um, had to turn pro- – it got so big that she's like – it was like, all right, are you going to make this real or not? Are you going to turn this into this nonprofit across the world that's going to be this really amazing opportunity? Or or, or, what do you, or, or what do you want to do with it? And ultimately, Emily wanted to be on the ground. She said, you know, that's not what I, – I had this vision. I had this dream. I built this organization. But I love, I want to get my hands dirty. Yeah. She's like, I don't want to be behind the desk. So uh, she, we closed the chapters and actually moved to Birdie, North Carolina. And there's actually a documentary about it. And I encourage everyone to find it because it's really, really good. Okay. Um, about her and her partner uh, who ran the organization basically m- shutting down shop, moving to one of the poorest areas of North Carolina and turning this town and bringing design to this school with no money. And what you're looking at right there is actually the outdoor, uh, the um, farmer's market that they built Mm, with the students for this part of town. They gave, this town didn't have internet. They brought internet there. They like, it was like really like poor. It was like during, it was like after, I forgot what year, I mean, what year this is, but there was like a horrible hurricane that kind of like just like decimated that area. And they just went there to help and rebuild. And since then, uh, she's turned it into a design build program for girls out in San Francisco, and it still exists mm. today. Wow. So again, for all the people on the West Coast listening, they should go check it out because it's an amazing program and um, really, mm. really cool thing. Wow. So yeah, that was um, so. Wa- this was kind of like the balance of what I was doing: I was designing kitchen tools right. and gadgets. <laughs> it's it's kind of it's inter- <laughs> it, no, it's interesting juxtaposition because I know that we have a lot of students that listen. And there's some professionals too, and everyone strives for the saved world, save the world design, right? Like right. everyone wants this type of work because it's it's fulfilling, it's super filling. You're helping people, and yet we are stuck doing the traditional industrial design of like making plastic products and like right. shipping them to Walmart and stuff. But I really like this aspect though because what you're telling us, Dan, is like, hey, you know, on the side you're doing this stuff. You are you are saving the world on the side. And then, like, you even asked your boss if you could do this stuff right. and, and take a month off from work. So, like, I, I just feel like that is really good advice just in general. Like, it's not it's not black and white. Like, you can, totally. you can do a lot of this stuff on the side if you want. A hundred percent. And here's also the twist. The reason I was able to do that and good at doing that, the reason mm-hmm. I was put in charge of this project was because I knew how to make things. Right. Right. <laughs> And I remember having chapter meetings in New York. We ran it out of this place in Brooklyn. And we, so we, this is like one project. We did a whole, a bunch of other things. And we'd be like, open call for designers. Anyone, please come. And we would only get students. We wouldn't get professionals because they were too busy or whatever it was. And that was really frustrating because I needed people who knew how to do Mm, things, how to make, how to build, how to manufacture. And I, would not have been able to pursue any of this if I didn't have that background. Right. Um, and even now, and I think, I mean, look, it's it's no different than what you guys are doing, right? right? Like you work, you have your own ventures, you're trying to do your own things. You're able to do that because you work for other clients. Right. Yeah. Because you're building your tools, you're, you're getting your skill set and your knowledge from that experience. And then you go, wow, now that I know how to make furniture, I'm going to make a stool. Yeah. You know, now that I know how to, you know, cast something or uh, whatever, CNC something, I'm able to build this really cool bottle right. opener. Well, it's funny to me that, you know, the fir- the this all started out because she followed Yves Bahar. And I feel like Yves right. Bahar has also done all this humanitarian, right. like, very, and but the way that he funds it is through his own studio. 100%. And, and so, like, he he just took a different route from her. He's still like he was still kind of like very interested in that type of design from like from the one laptop per child days. Right. But he had this idea of like I still want to do the traditional industrial design because I don't know, like I still I mean, I love traditional industrial design. Like I love making things and I love, you know, like right. what we do when we're working for different clients. But yeah, like using that money and then funneling it in and then having all the talent of the Fuse Project studio to be able yeah. to direct towards it. It is interesting that those like those two things, you saw those two people simultaneously 
and it's like one was one had this like very much like hey wake up here's right. my vision and the other one is just like I mean, not so quietly. I feel like Isbahar is very outspoken about like what he does. But right. He is doing this thing. He's just found a different mechanism to right. make it work. Right. And and I think what we've said wrong in this conversation, and what I said wrong back then, is that design can save the world. Like we're we're not here. We're right. not going to save the world. But what we can right. do is change the world. Right. And we can impact the world. Right. And I think what. Fuse Project's done very well, and what IDEO's done very well, Kaleidoscope has a program called Design Impact, they've done really well, is that they've used, they've leveraged their skills, their resources, the the work, their money, to do good. Yeah. To do better. Yeah. And that's real. Yeah. That's, that's the real world. Yeah. And, you know, it's, that's, it's not changing. So I think it's finding that balance where you can, look, you, we're, the problem also with this conversation is that we're not here to demonize good design right you know and we're not here to demonize the people that made this really awesome microphone you know like this thing's great this is all cool all the things around us are really cool objects and i wish i designed them (laughs) 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 and i'm like oh man like this thing's cool and i wish i designed that freaking laptop and like you know because i love what i love what we do right but you know it's again it's 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 not it's not black and white. It's just very right. very gray. Right. And right. I think the people who do it best understand that. Yeah. Um, so yeah. So uh, I was really fortunate at a young age, in early in my career, to expose myself to really different things. And yeah. it's just because I put myself out there. And yeah. that's another. You know, I, like I said, I mean, for all students, anyone listening, professional or young, to just like it's never too late to just right. try to just like extend yourself to, to make connections and to ask questions and just put yourself in different places. And another thing we will get to it later is like the work that I've done recently with New York city and the better bin project yeah. is such another great example of that. Like of just putting yourself out there in, in the competition even, and just trying your luck at a different, uh, different type of project. So, you yeah. know, cool opportunities, but you have to make them sometimes. Yeah, for sure. Um, I mean, uh, you know, maybe that's a little teaser. Should we should we run this into a two parter? I think we should run this into a two parter. Well, Dan, I appreciate you coming on the pod, and we are going to have two parter. And is there any way that at least this first part, you know, would you like to promote some of your work? Um, where can people reach you? Uh, yeah, um, I'm I'm horrible at the internet. Um, <laughs> 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 I'm decent at design and I'm horrible at the internet. Um, yeah. But uh, yeah, you can, I mean, you can check my work out at uh, dangrossmandesign.com. Okay. Uh, Dan Grossman Design is my uh, Instagram handle. And uh, definitely check out the work we're doing at Smart Design Worldwide. Cool. Cool. All right. Yeah. And as always, I'm at Nick B. Baker. I'm at I Draw Receipts. Peace out. Later.